sorry. Sorry, Britt. Yes, well, um, good morning and welcome to the senior working group of the South Bay State Council of Governments. Uh, my name is Britt Huff, I'm the chair and also Mayor Pro Tem of the City of, of Rolling Hills Estates. And uh, we welcome all of you. We have the city council people and representatives from senior centers and uh, just a multitude of people who are interested in helping seniors. So um, this morning, we are so fortunate to have Laura Trejo with us. And um, she has had what should we say, some transitions mm -hmm. in her life and her duties. So I'm just going to let her uh, give us a little background on, uh, you know, what you were doing originally and and how it transitioned and what's happening with your office now from the city, from the county of Los Angeles. So uh, welcome, Laura. Thank you, Brett. Really appreciate you guys making time for me this morning. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, you know, I feel a little bit kind of like uh, the godmother because I was there when you launched this group way back in the day when Grace Farwell was with all of you. Yes. Uh, you know, Grace and I have known each other since we were in our 20s, just so that you know. So full disclosure there. Um, so excited that you guys are continuing, um, you know, to meet and to plan and to intentionally think about older adults in your communities. As we all know, that is a, a reality of our times. Um, and so, uh, you know, just for context, uh, you all met me before in my previous role uh, as general manager of the city of Los Angeles Department of Aging. Um, of, uh, one of the things that I was working on, uh, I think the, the last couple of times I came to present to you was on Purposeful Aging Los Angeles, which yeah. was our age-friendly initiative and action plan that we launched in 2016 as a joint effort between city and county. Well, you know, part of that process began a discussion that was very interesting. I received a call from uh, one of the board members of the Board of Supervisors who said, why don't we have a Department of Aging, Laura, in the county? And I said, you do. Uh, it's called Workforce Development, Aging, and Community Services. That's where your area agency is embedded. And they said, yeah, but it's not like your department at the city. It's not independent. It's not uh, comprehensive addressing only older adults. I said, no, that's a decision you all made, not me. And so that began a dialogue uh, among the board members about, was that still the right uh, organizational structure for them, given what they were understanding of the work that we were doing on our age-friendly action plan that was speaking to the fact that Los Angeles County was gonna be home to one of the largest concentrations of older people in the United States. And so the board, yeah, I was very uh, touched how seriously board offices took that report and its uh, conclusions and recommendations. So we began a process of dialogue. I actually had to ask Mayor Garcetti if it was okay because I was spending so much time with board offices. I said, is that like allowed? And he said, yes, it is, uh, and allowed me to really serve almost in a consultant role to the board offices around uh, strategically thinking about what could be their next step. As a result, uh, they drafted a board motion that called for um, the analysis and evaluation of what the impact would be of developing a standalone comprehensive Department of Aging. And it passed unanimously, which I was told was incredibly uh, difficult to do, but they managed to do it. And so that was very touching to me that there was such level of support on the board. And, um, you know, as all things, you know, in, in, in policy and, and, and public service, you say, you know, we got five, six, 10 years for this to kind of, uh, uh, you know, stew a little bit and then we'll see where it lands. Well, that wasn't what the board um, had in mind. And this thing kept moving and moving. And even during the, the pandemic time when you know our whole nation was in such chaos, this motion just kept moving forward. And uh, so much so that about a, a year ago, um, the board actually uh, made the decision to develop a freestanding department. Um, the, you know, they, they approved it unanimously again. Uh, incredible support. And uh, so, uh, you know, they move forward in developing a, a freestanding Department of Aging and Disabilities. 
And they recruited. And I thought, you know what, since I've been the person telling them what they were doing wrong, it's only fair that I go try to figure it out. So, uh, so I applied for the position and, you know, very graciously have uh, this incredible opportunity uh, to help develop this new Department of Aging and Disabilities for LA County. Um, what's really important to me is that they've included adults with disability as part of our mission. Um, you know, in Los Angeles County right now, while we have 2 million older adults, we also have one out of 20 adults experiencing some level of disability sometime in their life, which, and the crossover is about 40%, 40% of older people experience some kind of a disability. So it made sense that they'd be a department that would advocate on behalf of those two populations. So part of the, the thing that has already occurred, uh, the Commission on Disabilities has now officially been transferred um, to my responsibility along with the Commission on Aging, which means we now have two very wonderful advocates and stakeholder groups uh, to inform our, our process and our work as our department evolves. Um, right now, our launch date is July 1. Uh, there will be a separation of the current Workforce Development, Aging, and Community Services Department, which will be uh, Los Angeles Aging and Disabilities Department, and there will be an uh, Economic Opportunities Department that will do all of those functions that um, are associated with, with the work of uh, workforce development. Um, so uh, at both ends, very exciting work occurring in LA County. Um, we are, for example, on our side of the, of the work, our new department will not only have adult protective services, uh, the area agency and aging, but also we received uh, uh, 14 community and senior service centers um, that Los Angeles operates. So all of those are now on our side of the work that we're doing. Uh, we are also very much, there's a lot of excitement at the board level for this new department. So there's uh, already a lot of activity uh, to include us. For example, the, uh, there was a board motion passed addressing social isolation while it was not specifically to older adults because you know the pandemic showed all populations were affected in that way, uh, including youth and children, as well as adults and older adults. Uh, a lot of that uh, discussion was, you know, how could the knowledge, the value that aging brings to the table and people working with disabilities inform this process? Um, the, the, the short answer is, one of the things uh, I've, I've put together is a sort of a mini consortium, a mini steering committee of department heads that will help guide um, you know, any work that happens around social isolation for LA County, because it has to be across the lifespan. It has to be interdepartmental. All of us who work uh, in public service knows that no one of us holds the answer uh, to the question, but all of us hold parts of the answer. So, uh, my approach has been, how do we collaborate? How do we move forward? For example, there's another project uh, emerging in the county to really look at equity and social justice in everything that we do across all of the program areas and service areas of LA County. And so I will be working, uh, helping to co-lead a work group around coordination. Um, when I was looking at kind of all the aspects of the work that they were looking at, I thought, what is the most impactful to older people and people with disabilities, silos. The fact that we're not coordinated is usually one of the things that affects these populations the most. When we are not working in tandem with each other, uh, older people don't do well and persons with disabilities don't do well. So I said, so if I have time to spend on this, I'm gonna spend it on coordination issues and how are we going to make sure that the suite of programs that LA County offers really have the impact on the communities that we want to have. And that many times is because there's uh, such a lack of understanding of the different types of work that every agency does. You know? So I'm looking just internally. We have you know, literally over a couple of hundred independent programs that we have oversight over. Well, the county, when you look at all of the services we provide, it's literally hundreds. And so how, was, how are communities supposed to engage and access and understand the supports available to them? So uh, for the next few months, I will be working uh, with uh, uh, other department heads around the issue of how do we really develop um, an intentional policy approach to ensuring that we're not just uh, 
you know, solving a social problem, but really improving the life of residents in Los Angeles County. That, that really is our ultimate goal, is how to, through the work that we do, improve and add value um, to the lives that people live in our communities. So, um, so a lot of work happening on that, a lot of work around social justice and equity, as probably all of you are doing. Um, you know, all of us are very involved in making sure that our, um, our approaches, our policies, our staff really understand the impact of inequities that have been sort of built in to the systems that we are responsible for. And then how do we begin to be the change agents within those systems um, to make them better, to make it more accessible? Uh, you know, my work in aging has been around uh, health disparities. Probably all of you have seen all the articles coming out in the field of aging. Uh, in the field of healthcare, how um, inequities that have been built in over time disproportionately impact communities uh, that are low income, um, that are less educated, that are of color. You know, I was in a meeting with Dr. Barbara Ferrer, our public health officer, and she said that regrettably, one of the most important factors as to whether or not people would experience the most extreme negative outcomes as a result of COVID was not the disease itself. It was your zip code. How hmm. frightening is that? To think that your zip code is going to determine whether or not you may actually uh, experience hospitalization or death as a result of a pandemic. Uh, but that has to do with uh, inequities that are built in to how people experience their lives. So for me, working with older adults, you know, they've experienced it throughout a lifespan. Um, I work with older people who have firsthand experience at some of the worst things that people can do to each other. Uh, because they have lived through them. And so to me, that is also an opportunity for us to uh, pay attention and learn about life cycle and how it affects um, our communities. Because uh, when I look at an older person, I'm also thinking what's happening to that child, right? Who is gonna grow up and experience, uh, you know, the effects of a life lived uh, under various uh, stressors. So if, you know, if a child is going hungry as a child, they're not developing correctly. Well, I can tell you when I get to work with them 50, 60, 70 years later, I'm going to see the impact and the effect that that malnutrition had uh, on their, you know, on their uh, bone health. I can see it in different ways that it, it affects uh, and expresses itself. So uh, a lot of the work that all of us are being asked to do around social justice, equity, inclusion, is critical to older adults. Uh, older adults experience multiple jeopardies. Uh, you know, it's not only that they are aging, but they may be aging as a person of color who has experienced uh, racial or other kinds of discrimination. They're also experiencing physical changes where they may be experiencing a disability, et cetera. All of those things add up. And so when we're looking at older people, we end up looking at one of the most complex populations to serve because they are. Um, the sum of everything that they've experienced. You know, one of my favorite professors a long time ago said, you know, the older you get, the older you become, the more unique you are. Um, because we are that, you know, a, a sum of life experience and exposure over time. So um, the work that I'm doing right now is very uh, important, I believe, to Los Angeles County residents, because we are trying to be very intentional in helping to lead in different areas that affect the quality of life of how people age, because our goal is we wanna make Los Angeles the best place to grow old in the world. And in order to do that, we have to be challenging systems. We have to be uh, really uh, thinking through how policy affects um, the, the way that we implement and deliver services and supports in our community. So, um, you know, a lot of the work as we're all seeing, for example, the rise in homelessness, uh, are there communities that you're serving that has never experienced homelessness? Because I don't think in LA County, you could raise your hand and say, we have never seen homelessness in our community. Well, guess what? One of the highest uh, rising numbers among the homeless population are among over the age of 50. People who have lived their lives have met milestones. These are not chronically homeless people something is happening where they are triggering into uh, unhoused status. Uh, I can tell you, that's why I went back to school about three years ago, because I was like, 
I need to figure this out. This is not happening in my community that I'm just going to sit here. And so a lot of what my work has been is around economic insecurity and how it really impacts the likelihood that somebody will become homeless. And so a lot of wonderful possibilities in this field, a lot of work to be done, a lot of uh, innovation that needs to take place. I think all of you uh, have some tremendous opportunities to help us um, you know, sort of redesign and reinvent the communities that we want to age in uh, and that our loved ones uh, should have uh, opportunities. I can tell you, I use that standard all the time. Would I do something different if it was for my mom or for somebody I love? Uh, because then that's what I want to be doing. I want to do whatever is in their best interest. So all of us have that opportunity in our communities. And hopefully uh, you have a partner in me. Uh, so reach out. Um, keep an eye on what we're doing. Um, we are really going to be looking at um, evaluating how the master plan on aging, for example, I know that Susan DeMorris, I think has spoken to you or will be. Uh, we are partnering with her. Um, there's a tremendous opportunity for us in Los Angeles County to work with our state and to really help influence. That's one of my priorities. How does, how does the needs of Los Angeles influence what we're doing in Sacramento? Because to the degree that we're not, that's a problem. And so we need to start doing that more directly. And I can tell you, I'm working very closely with uh, Susan, with Kim McCoy Wade over in the governor's office, because we wanna make sure that the needs of Los Angeles are reflected in uh, state level policy and budgeting. So that's also an area that we're paying a lot of attention to right now uh, to make sure that we can help uh, support their work, uh, but also for them to support our work. So those are some of the things, you know, we're working on a, a regional aging and disability resource uh, connection. Uh, we will be working with all six independent living centers in Los Angeles County to launch that. Hopefully uh, within a year, uh, we will be able to uh, develop that infrastructure for LA County. Um, we're also looking at ways that we continue to partner with the, between the two area agencies, city and county. Uh, so that we become seamless. One of the things that I'm most excited about is that for the first time in the history of the two AAAs, we've received permission from the California Department of Aging to develop one single strategic area plan for all of LA County, as opposed to two, which has been the norm for the last 40 years. There would be one plan, one set of goals, one set of priorities for everybody that lives in the Los Angeles County region. That has been consistently a problem and a gap because we're only place in the United States that had two different plans coexisting in one county region. And so it was, it, nobody had to check with each other. Nobody had to agree. It was just, you, you know, as a director of the Department of Aging of the City, I wrote whatever I wanted. And the director of the county wrote whatever they wanted. And we didn't have to even consult each other. Um, I didn't think that was right, even when we were doing our, our purposeful aging work. And so one of our deliverables under purposeful aging was to request authority to develop one integrated plan. So that was granted. And so the next area plan for LA County will be a single plan on behalf of, of all the residents that live in, this, in these communities. So that's one of the areas that you know, we've been moving very aggressively on. Um, and so many others are coming. Uh, we have a list of our to-dos. And so um, I can tell you it's gonna be a fun and very busy next few years. So. I would love the opportunity for you to ask any questions that you may have of me before I have to leave. Well, that's uh, thanks so much for that overview. And it's very exciting to see this kind of coordination going on because in the final analysis, our seniors are gonna be the winners in terms of being able to focus on their problems. So um, might I maybe ask the first sure. question that re is regard regarding um, the various county commissions. And I'm, I'm assuming with this transition, it affects a, a couple of, of the commissions, uh, like uh, you know the Commission on Aging, is that trans transferring into your department or is there some overlap? How is that going to work? The Commission on Aging is already here. Uh, that was always under the area agency. Uh, the commission that was uh, just granted to us was the Commission on Disabilities. So that one has now officially been transferred, has been with us since February. Um, and I can tell you, I already have a, a, a working group. They're working on um, sort of a um, post-COVID uh, interventions for 
our community and I already have the co-chairs are one member of the Commission on Aging and one member of the Commission on Disabilities. They literally had never worked together before in Los Angeles County because they were in completely different structures. So they didn't even know each other existed. Now they're sitting at a table talking to each other about how will we make recommendations that benefits as many persons in Los Angeles County as possible. That's how we intentionally begin to change our response in what we do, is we put the, you know, the stakeholders, the leaders in the same room to begin to get to know each other and begin to develop shared vision of how to improve the quality of life for everybody, as opposed to I'm only thinking this way. You know, we just uh, worked with a food insecurity work group and they kept telling us that uh, we were only there to speak on behalf of older adults and adults with disabilities. And we said, we do not accept that. Where are the advocates for children? And there weren't a single advocate speaking on behalf of young people. And we said, that's not acceptable. We refuse to be part of this process if you do not bring in, um, you know, experts on uh, child food insecurity because that's one of the things we learned from COVID. Everybody was equally exposed. And I can tell you as a result of that, they're now creating a subgroup just to address the issues of youth and, and, and children. That's the impact that we can have as advocates when we uh, sort of have a bigger vision of what our role is. And for us, because we're dealing with adults, we also wanted to deal with, you know, uh, we know there are younger people in the world. We don't ignore them. We just wanna make sure they're at the table and they're considered equally to the needs of older people, to the needs of adults with disability. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's gonna be an interesting and wonderful process because I think one of the biggest uh, differentials that I see, you know, services and programs will continue. The difference is that there's now a voice mm -hmm. that represents this group. And that yeah. really has not existed. Uh, there was always, uh, and, and you know, and I've said this to board members, the problem was that you had a department head that had to speak on economic opportunity and development, aging, dependent adults, and all. something is going to get lost in the communication. And I think often what got lost was aging and disabilities and people with, you know, uh, potential uh, dependencies. Uh, so we often were lost in the, in the importance of workforce uh, in economic development, which was appropriate, but uh, not from my point of view. So that is one of the biggest things that I think is changing is that we're independently uh, have a voice at the table. Yes, <clears throat> wonderful. Well, um, maybe I'll turn to uh, Lori, our staff person, to uh, or Ronson, who can view any hands up with questions. If you have a question, you can put it in, um, raise the hand button. Uh, Lori, do we have questions? Sure, we do. And we have one in the chat before they raised hands from Harry. And she wanted to know how we can get AARP age-friendly cities programs moving in our south, which it sounds sort of like you said there's six different um, entities that are going to oversee that, if I understood correctly. That's uh, that's not an age-friendly. Uh, the, the six was the independent living centers. Uh, that's for people with disabilities. But age friendly, I would recommend that you talk to, um, you know, Rafi over at AARP or Adriana. Those are the leads uh, for uh, age friendly work. Rafi in particular is the person that I work with over at AARP. But if you need the contact, let me know. Happy to, to, to put you in contact with him. Thank you. I have Rafi's contact. I think probably the issue is more the lack of resources for each city because it takes a lot of work and none of the cities, um, nor us, <laughs> has the funding and the resources to make this happen. So I'm wondering if there can be more of a consolidated effort and some uh, funding opportunities that the county might know about. I, I don't because I'll tell you when I launched my initiative, I had no staff and no funding either. <laughs> uh, this was a labor of love and a file that I carried around for like six years because, you know, that's when we had the, I, I started to think about this in 2008. Think about what it took me. I did not launch the 2016, but I had my file from 2008. But then we went into a small thing called the, you know, the, the recession there for a while. So it just sent my, my plans away. Um, you know, I want to recommend that you think about this differently. This is not about budgets. Uh, if you look at the action plan for purposeful aging, did you notice there were not a single budget request made in it? I can tell you because the board asked me that question. Why wasn't I asking them for money? 
Purposeful Aging for us was never about funding requests. It was about strategic opportunities to redefine how we did our work. So I've always thought about it as a planning, strategy, convening work because that moves mountains. Uh, sometimes we get a budget item, it stops right there. You never get more than the one FTE. Uh, you know, I literally have had 4,000 public bus stops reviewed by the Department of Street Services. That would have taken literally years to request in a, some kind of a order to do. It was part of their work and contribution to Purposeful Aging Los Angeles. We have been able to do such remarkable investments and strategic partnerships that were literally not possible to do with funding, but they were really possible to do good with goodwill and with people being at the table discussing needs. So if you think about it differently, I promise you the money will come. Uh, you have to have faith because I have, uh, because people then begin to see the wisdom of reallocating their resources. When we started, we had no staff allocated for all of LA County, not zero. I was a staff person. My thing was I had a vision of what I was trying to build. I now have a Department of Aging and Disabilities. People trust me, the money does come with it. Well, thank you. Um, it, it's about just having a strategic vision. So don't right. stop, uh, do it what you can. That's what I did. You know, I did as little or as much as I could. And then I started to ask my friends and colleagues to join me at the table. And we started to build this kind of energy about the kind of change we wanted to see in our community. And nobody had budgets, nobody had money. I can tell you, I literally begged everybody I knew in our both government systems just to even do our survey. I had no budget for that. And we did 14,000 surveys in nine languages, the first time in LA County history that we did that for older people and people with disabilities. That was done because people believed in the process. And so folks started to share and say, you know, we can help you with the adaptation. We can do this, we can do that. Right. It's a coordination approach. Well, that's great advice. And I know the will is there. Let me get on to so we can get these other questions in. Melissa, sure. you're next. Yes. Hi. Good morning. Uh, sorry, morning. my camera's not working, but this is Melissa with Beach City's Health District, Laura. Mm -hmm. Thank you yes. for joining and for sharing all your wisdom as always. But I, I was curious if we're involved in learning more or getting involved with any of these working groups or committees you're speaking about, who's the best contact for that? You know, for the short term, I will be sending me an email that you're interested in whatever I mentioned. Just let okay. me know. Okay. And I will make sure that I direct you to the right place. Okay, perfect. Uh, so like if you're interested in the work we're doing with the aging and, you know, the uh, aging and um, disability resource connection, you know, where we're trying to work, bring together aging and the disability communities, let me know. If you're interested in social isolation, let me know. I will direct you to who, who's a person that's leading that. Wonderful. Okay. Well, my email will be coming to you soon. And I, you know what I'll do is I'll post mine on your chat. Great. So that all of you have my, my email, okay? Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Valentine? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Trejo, for your, uh, for your very insightful speaking. Um, I'm curious to know, um, in our communities, very often we have uh, people who are, are socially isolated, who are also, who, um, you know, need help, need advice. They perhaps may not have family members around to give them advice on uh, issues that they're facing as aging people. And I'm just wondering, do you have people that go and visit with community groups and talk to them? It would depend on the topic. We usually are very topic specific, not generic, not like, you know, but one of the things that I'm doing, and maybe you guys wanna be, um, wanna do follow up with me. We have been offering this 10-week uh, uh, workshop for communities, uh, for older adults. Uh, it's called the H Mastery Program. It's actually an evidence-based program uh, developed by the National Council on Aging. And we have been deploying that. Uh, it's, it's basically all the questions that you wanted to know about aging, but were afraid to ask kind of an approach. So it starts with you know financial issues, health issues, you know, how do you plan? Uh, to develop and redesign your life uh, post-retirement. It's a, people are loving it. It's a, it's a very um, wonderful approach. You know, they actually do homework. They have to think through 
uh, on strategies for their, you know, how to, how to be better nutrition. There's a whole workshop that we developed on better nutrition, uh, taking care of your sleep, you know, because again, all of our patterns change and people don't realize um, medication management. I mean, it's, it's literally yes. ABCs. Uh, of many of the questions that are on oh, my direct line. So, <laughs> if is, is this, so let is, me know and we can and we can let you know uh, where it's going to be offered next. A lot of it right now is done virtually uh, for the safety of older adults. Um, so let me know if you're interested. Maybe we can hook you up with, uh, you know, doing maybe a shared workshop for some of your communities uh, because we do require, I think, uh, for the in-person, there's a minimum. Uh, uh, number of participants, but if we go online, that you know, then it could be a, a much larger group. Okay, so but you but you you don't have anything specific. You're saying if you have specific questions, but you don't really have someone to go around two different groups and talk to them. Usually, on, not on a generic basis, like just what are your questions about aging? No, I haven't. I've I've not done that. Uh, we we may have targeted workshops that we do or educational opportunities that we provide older adults in the community. I think right now we're trying to revamp all that because we've kind of all, you know, been teleworking like everybody for the last almost two and a half years. So we're just starting to reopen all of our sites right now. So we're looking at programming. A lot of our senior centers, for example, are doing a lot of work on uh, coping with, uh, you know, depression, uh, cope, you know, how to, how to kind of reconnect back to family and community. So, um, a lot of our older adults were very socially isolated during the last two years. So uh, that's been our priority was and to- when you say, And when you say your senior centers, where are they? Uh, they're within the Los Angeles County area. Most of them are in unincorporated areas. Those are just the ones that I oversee, but I work with about 150 senior centers in LA County. So we are uh, supporting uh, sending speakers. So, but if you're particularly interested in an area, let me know, reach out to me, email me, I'll work with you. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good, okay, I think we have time for a couple more. Uh, Lori, do you have any other hands up? Uh, no, I, I don't think so, I don't see any. I do not see any other hands, or do I see any comments in the chat? Well, <laughs> doc, Dr. Um, Trejo, we certainly appreciate your joining us. Thank you. And uh, congratulations again on your appointment to the new uh, Department of Aging. And, uh, and just your, your willingness to be so available to uh, all, all of our participants here on the senior working group because um, uh, they come from many different senior centers and cities and so forth. So uh, it's wonderful to be able to have that access. So- Well, um, thank you and invite me back in maybe six months and I'll give you an update, you know, if I'm still like coherent at that point. Uh, I'd be happy to come back. Uh, thank you for continuing to uh, really uh, be the leaders in your communities on behalf of older adults and their families. I know that you have a partner in me at Los Angeles. Reach out. Uh, whatever I can do to support you, it will be an honor to do so. So thank you for inviting me this morning. Really appreciate it. And also accommodating. I apologize, but the CMS director asked to meet with me. You know, LA County is now getting on the map. So so oh, they, we, we have one quick hand from Harriet. Sure. Is it a quick question, Harriet? Yeah, mine is about. Oh, sorry. Hi, uh, mine is about caregiving. There seems to be there's a real crisis in caregiving, and uh, I know you're working on it at the state level. There's a lot going on, but how soon can we get some? Do you think we can get training and improve the pay and have uh, have something change because? This is a crisis. I recommend that you invite Dr. Donna Benton. She is yeah. my go-to expert on caregiving and families. Uh, she is the executive director of the Los Angeles Caregiver Resource Center at USC. She is a subject matter expert in this field. And I would recommend that she would be an outstanding speaker for you guys to really engage uh, with kind of all of the, because she's like in every group in California that you guys want to know about uh, in terms of caregiving. So. I, that, that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, she is a great resource and that. Thanks for that idea. We will we'll certainly reach out to her. So uh, well, thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, and thank you for making the time for us. And uh, we'll hope to see you in a few months. 
I look forward to it. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. All right. Well, that was wonderful. And thank you to our staff, Lori and Bronson, for arranging that for us. And uh, it's pretty exciting to see this kind of coordination and consolidation going on. So hopefully we will um, see some, some big changes. So, and uh, for those of you who joined us a little late, thank you for, for being here. That was Dr. Laura Trejo, who is the new executive, uh, executive director of the Los Angeles County Department of Aging. And uh, we, uh, I think uh, hopefully most of you got the, the memo email from staff saying, had to move her up in the agenda because of her schedule, uh, a, a conflict had come up. So we will now move then to our uh, next item on the agenda and that is our PATH update. And we thank you, Courtney Reed and uh, Anna so much for uh, accommodating our schedule and welcome. Good morning, no problem, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Courtney, this is Anna, our program manager for our street-based intensive uh, case management team, and I'm the associate director for our SPOT 8 services here at PATH. Um, for those of you that, that don't know, PATH is uh, People Assisting the Homeless. We're a nonprofit agency that's statewide um, whose mission is to end homelessness for families, communities, and individuals. Um, and so Anna has the update um, since the last time we met, and she'll give you all that update. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, as of today, for the Provincial District 2, we have 10 seniors in our caseload. Maybe let me interrupt a little bit and ask, uh, can you be a little closer to the microphone? Are, are any of you having trouble hearing? Sorry, does this, one, does this work? Yes, that's better. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, we're working with dinosaur laptops here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we have a total of 10 seniors in our Supervisor District 2. On our caseload, um, nine seniors in our Supervisor District 4 um, caseload. Um, recently, we have continued making rapid rehousing referrals. Three of our seniors in our caseloads have um, been enrolled to rapid rehousing successfully. Um, we have five seniors who have been matched to vouchers. And we have three issuance, um, one that's happening today, actually. So um, two already have issuance in their hands and one will have it today if everything goes well and all the um, signatures and paperwork and, and documents are submitted today. Um, other than that, again, we have been seeing an increase of seniors on the streets. Um, there is an encampment in the city of Lenox, um, 101 Irwin in Lenox, um, and we see about um, five seniors in that location, which is, um, you may think is not a lot, but considering the, um, the amount that we've seen previously in that location, um, once we started going, which was earlier in February, we had only seen maybe two seniors, and now we're seeing five. So there was an increment of three seniors. Um, and honestly, the reason for that being is they say that they lost their house or they, they were staying with someone and they can no longer stay with them. Um, one of them explained that they were staying with a friend who passed away and the family of the friend um, put the senior out on the streets. So there is also a lack of um, affordable housing, a lack of um, senior housing or supportive care that the seniors are able to afford without the vouchers. Um, it's just straight out of their budget unfortunately. Um, but yeah, that is our update as of now. Great, thank you. Anything else, Courtney? No, that's it. If anyone has any questions, um, you know, you can feel free to answer them. But just so you know, when we say referred to wrapper housing, that means they've been connected to a time limited subsidy um, that will pay rent, um, you know, for an amount of time with the, with the hope of either connecting them to a longer term subsidy or connecting them to, um, um, or successfully graduating them from the program because they can afford the rent on their own. So we encourage roommate situations um, a lot for those types of things so people can kind of make their money stretch. Um, this Friday, we'll be having an event. Um, it's not open to the public, but it is for people on our caseload across all of our programs to come and view units, look on our lease up <coughs> um, website, um, we're going to have Tom for, from Share Collaborative Housing here. We're going to have lease up representatives on site 
to kind of have like that last final housing push. Um, and hopefully people can, you know, get a chance to meet each other and become roommates if possible. Um, but if we're having like a housing unit application viewing fair this Friday for our the people on our caseloads, um, because we want to get everyone housed, um, especially before the new fiscal year starts, because um, there's some changes with LASA. So we want to make sure that people are using their vouchers um, and not missing out on opportunities. It's already hard to identify units. Um, and then it's even harder to, you know, convince the landlord to accept Section 8, even though technically and legally they can't deny because of Section 8, but their loopholes, um, you know, asking for three times the amount of income and things like that. So those are barriers and challenges that we're facing as well. Um, so, you know, wish us luck this Friday for this event. <laughs> we want people to be able to, you know, get a viewing schedule, you know, fill out applications, um, go look at units. Um, and things like that. So please send positive vibes our way for this Friday's event. Um, thank you. And that's all we have. Do you have a um, uh, website uh, contact information for people who would like to pursue that for Friday? Well, it's, for, it's, it's not open to the public. It's for the people that our team, our housing team and our street-based intensive case management team are currently okay. case managing. Okay. So, yes. Okay, great. And uh, you mentioned changes to LASA after the, uh, uh, the, the turn of the year. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, LASA is um, actually some of our housing slots are being decreased. Um, and there's just other changes within LASA that involve housing navigation. And so we want to make sure that we don't have people kind of get um, miss out on opportunities before they lose the opportunity, basically. Mm -hmm. So. Good. Uh, do we have any other questions, uh, Lori or Ronson? Do you see any hands up? No, th thank you guys for the work that you do. It's, it's just absolutely amazing. But are seniors, um, not that anybody's a priority, but are they a priority on the list when you have a whole bunch of people? Um, is Are they higher up on the priority list? Yes, um, for vouchers, they are prioritized as well as people that are experiencing domestic violence. Those are kind of the priority. Um, we haven't seen, it's kind of hard to say that they are actually a priority when it comes to getting the vouchers. We have, it's been slow movement. And I think that's because it's maybe just a higher number. Um, and so while we can say it's prioritized, it's still um, you know, quite a bit of people um, that have to kind of get through that, you know, get through the list and stuff. So, um, and then internally, we, yeah, we prioritize seniors, um, you know, within our team as well. But one thing I've noticed because I'm getting more and more calls um, from seniors or about seniors is quite often because of their um, health conditions, they really need f first floor units. And that's really seems to have been a, a barrier because they're, they, they can't walk up the stairs. And if there's not an elevator in a building, um, my understanding is sometimes they, they have to turn them down. Has that been your experience too? Yeah, I mean, just you know, looking for that perfect unit um, is, is the biggest barrier too. You know, we have, you know, you have to get through what location somebody is comfortable um, living in. Like, you know, a lot of people don't wanna live in Los Angeles. Um, they want to stay in the cities that they probably are primarily homeless in. And so that's one barrier. And then finding a landlord that's willing to take someone who is formerly experiencing homelessness or experiencing homelessness and doesn't have a lot of income, that's another barrier. And then the actual building, you know, is it, um, you know, handicap accessible and things like that. And so, all, you know, all of those are barriers in finding the units. And so we just have to continue to navigate that. Um, luckily with the Lisa website, we can kind of um, filter out those types of things and see um, you know, right away if it's handicap accessible and, and things like that. So <clears throat> luckily we can use Lisa to kind of help navigate some of that, but there's still challenges. Good, okay. Well, thank you both for coming and giving us an update. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Um, all right. So let's move on to our uh, item five on the agenda, which is an update on tenant housing and issues. And our staff person, Ronson Chu, 
is going to be providing that. Thank you, Ronson. Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, as you know, Laura's mentioned, and as Anna and the PATH team has mentioned, we are seeing an increase in number of evictions uh, of those in the older age population. Uh, you know, as you may know, our uh, prevention specialist, homeless prevention specialist, Kathy Hetzer, the Harbor Interfaith is kind of our go-to person. And it just seems like it's almost like every week Lori is calling her with another case of someone who was an older adult being evicted. And so what we did, uh, I believe Councilmember Uphoff even suggested this in our, in our uh, homeless task force meeting was to create kind of some information materials so that we can distribute into the community. And Lori's done a great job of creating uh, a flyer. Lori, do you, do you have like the latest and greatest you can throw up? Okay, it's still gonna have a few more tweaks. <laughs> so um, do you have, uh, do I have the ability to share screen? Uh, I, you try it. Okay. Did that work? Yeah. Okay, right. so I'm still making a couple of minor changes, but you get the idea. Okay. Um, yeah, so on, so what we, we're, we're trying to do is, is, is let people know that uh, if you're, so the backdrop of all of this is that a lot of the eviction moratorium uh, rules are expiring this year. Um, the other thing that is not uh, understood well by, by folks in general is that when you do get served an eviction notice, uh, you only have about five days to respond to that notice, or you you will get evicted, like 99% of a guarantee. The other thing too is if you are facing eviction and you don't um, seek out pro bono legal advice, 99% uh, of the time you will be evicted. So eviction is almost a short thing once the landlord decides that they're going to go ahead and do it. the The best way to to help with that is to get free legal advice, and so. The, the, the gist of this is to get people to contact State House LA. That's still the leading agency in LA County to connect you with different resources like El, like um, Inner City Law Center, uh, Neighborhood Legal Services, uh, uh, and there's a whole host of other uh, pro bono legal services people can obtain. And we also wanted to just educate folks on what happens uh, if you don't pay your rent in, under certain periods. So the first period was during the pandemic, October 2020 through March 31st, 2022. In this period, if you didn't pay your rent, you had the opportunity to partner with your landlord and apply for housing as key, which provided, California State provided the ability to pay your back rent uh, going as far back as 2020. Um, if you didn't apply for this um, as of March 31st, you're, you're, you're less protected of an eviction. And so again, um, if you didn't pay rent during this period and are now facing eviction, uh, contact State House LA, contact Free Legal Services, and, uh, and so that you can uh, have a eviction defense. The next period is kind of the period we're in right now, which is April 1st, 2022 and June 30th, 2022. Uh, this is kind of a little, like a, like a black hole in the, policy in LA County. And in a lot of jurisdictions in LA County, if you don't pay your rent during this period, there is less protections for you. So it's very important that you do try to pay your rent during this period. Uh, but again, if you fail, if you do not pay your rent in this period, uh, again, contact free legal advice because they may have other options for you. And then the next period is coming up. It's starting July 1st through the end of the year. LA County, if you don't pay your rent during this time, um, you may qualify for assistance if you meet certain criteria. And again, you know, we're not the lawyers here. We strongly encourage people to contact their, a pro bono legal attorney to help them navigate through these requirements. Um, and so the next thing I want to do is kind of just let everyone know like what these websites are and, and what they can do. Um, so um, Lori, I am going to share my screen now um, and just pull up. Okay, so this is the State Housed LA website and um, you can go on this website and just, and they have 
in, in a bunch of different languages. And then you just click on get, get legal help. Um, and, and they'll just ask you for your street address and unit number to make sure you are within LA County. So this then will then refer you to one of their partners uh, and they have quite a lot of different partners. Um, I wonder if they list it here. Um, no, they'll just, they'll just direct you. But like I mentioned, some of the ones are an inner city law center, neighborhood legal services, and um, a, a, a lot more. The other thing you can do is go to the tenant power toolkit. So UCLA created this. They've done a lot of research on evictions. Uh, some of the interesting stats that they, they talk about is that 69% uh, of all homelessness starts with an eviction. So uh, this could mean that you're being evicted from your apartment or your mother is sick and tired of you and kicks you out. Um, so, but the eviction is one of the primary causes of homelessness. It kind of starts that descending um, um, kind of fall into homelessness, if you will. And so another thing that they've also are looking at is they predict that with the expiration of eviction moratoriums, uh, it's going to increase people falling into the homelessness by about 120,000 households. Um, so that's households, not even people. Uh, and just to put that in perspective, on average, we have about 50,000 plus people fall into homelessness in LA County. So they are predicting because of the coronavirus and the end of eviction protections, uh, we're gonna see maybe double or triple that amount of people falling into homelessness. I really hope they're wrong because I think our infrastructure is stressed as it is. We can't take it that type of multiplier of homelessness, but that's what they're predicting. And so it's, it's kind of sobering and, and scary to think. And so what they did is they created this tenant power toolkit, which will help you file an eviction defense. So remember, you only have five days to respond to the eviction, five days to respond to the court. If you don't respond in those five days, you will be evicted. So you have a really tight window from when you're served in an eviction notice to when you have to respond. So you can go here to start your defense and they will help you file for you. And they can do it in English and Spanish and it'll walk you through the steps. So it's a very powerful toolkit for people to use. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to share those tools for people and just to spread the word out. I'm gonna have Lori send this out to our supervisors as well as to Laura so that we can disseminate this information um, all across LA County. I was actually at a legal women voters meeting, um, homelessness meeting last week in the Valley for LA City and the greater Los Angeles region. And I presented this information there as well. So we are, we're just trying to get the word out. We want to prevent evictions and uh, keep seniors in their houses. Can I just add to that, that um, as we know, a lot of people are not necessarily online. So we're really trying to be thoughtful and thorough on how we're going to disseminate or distribute this information. Um, we're, we're putting together a strategy to have hard copy flyers too for every organization to have in their lobbies to include on Meals on Wheels with programs at community centers posted in the libraries. We need to try and reach the people who normally you wouldn't necessarily reach online. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks for the update. I think we have some um, questions to um, mm -hmm. Council, Council Member Valentine. Yes, um, thank you, Ronson. So um, you're going to have, uh, this flyer made available to the public, is that right? The one you just showed us? Yes. And when do you think that will be? Because I would like to have it. We, we, uh, we can post it on our own website, but, you know, each city can do that. But I'd like to know when you'll have it available. So as I, I make the final little tweaks and I get it get the green light from Jackie Bacharach, <laughs> it will be um, available to you. And right. we, we didn't scroll down to the bottom, but it also said if you're experiencing homelessness and it has the resources there too. Um, so in, in addition to the eviction, um, getting a case manager with PATH or Harbor Interfaith to help you. I, so does, I think, it ha does it have the information that, that, that you just showed from yes, State House LA? Y um, yes. Yes. And, and let me just tell you that every website I went to um, inner city law or, you know, um, Bet Sadak, all of those sites took me back to stay housed LA to fill out the free legal aid form. So that seems to be the, the uh, starting point. Um, Ronson B is raising her hand. <laughs> uh, yes, good morning. 
Um, I'm with focal point on aging where we get many calls on evictions. Can we now refer them to the stay housed LA phone number now, or is that still in the working? That you can do now. We're just making sure the flyer information, since it's going to so many people, is as comprehensive and accurate as possible. Okay. And if they do not have a computer, which is common in many seniors, they can actually call and perhaps uh, the information would be taken over the phone to fill out the form. I believe so. And that's, I did put a phone number for Stay Housed LA. And of course, that's always a concern. Okay. And I'm um, hoping, and you know what, I'll call the number and find out what they do if somebody doesn't have great. a computer. And is there any chance that we can uh, receive that printout to go to our senior centers like Torrance um, since we get so many calls? Or is it ready to be sent out? Soon. I'm hoping by the end of today or tomorrow. <laughs> okay. That is a great wealth of information because um, it's really hard with the evictions and their older people and they just don't understand what it entails and none of their friends do. So this kind of spells it out. And when you call Shared House, Lori, um, how will you get that information to us to find out or we could call ourselves, right? To find out if they really are working now and how they can be of help. Well, the program's in place. Okay. That's been in place. But I want to call the number to find out your very excellent question is if somebody's not online, what's the other um, way that they could get the form filled out if there's somebody that can walk you through the form online. So I plan to do that today okay. and include all that information when I send this out to everybody. Great. That's a good idea. And Lori, uh, when that is done, can you email that out to everyone here in, in attendance on, as an attachment? Absolutely. Everybody in our distribution, everybody that's at this meeting, everybody and anybody in the South Bay will get this well, flyer. Well, so if you're not on Lori's list, make sure you send her your email address. Yeah, everybody in this meeting has registered, so I have their emails. Oh, good. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, any other questions, uh, Ronson? Do you see anybody? Oh, Janet Turner had a question from Tendu's office. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for everyone's great work on the subject. Um, just wondering, is there any agency or, or central point that is keeping track of how many seniors uh, in your area uh, are being um, uh, faced with eviction? I, I mean, because numbers are really important sometimes for getting funding. So I was just wondering if anyone's thought about that. That's a great point. Um, I, I echo those sentiments. You know, too bad we don't have Katsi Hetzer here today, but I wonder if Adult Protective Services is keeping track of this information. Uh, Lori, maybe we should send Katsi an email and see if this is something that they keep track of and figure out if there's any data or anything like that that we can okay. start calling. Yeah. Will do. Good. OK, any last questions? Then let's move on to our update from legislative offices. And we'll start with Janet Turner from Congressman Liu's office. Well, I know there's a lot in the works, but I don't have anything too concrete to report this month. Hopefully next month, though, I'll have uh, some very uh, interesting uh, specific legislation. Um, uh, but I do know that there's lots in the works. So that's about all for me. Thanks. Oh, great. Well, thanks for being here. We always we appreciate your attending. Uh, Bronson, do we have any other uh, legislators? Um, oh, yeah, Eric, Eric from uh, Mayor Suchi's office. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Eric with the Office of Assembly Member Muratsuchi. I just wanted to update the group on uh, one of, of the Assembly Members' bills, um, AB 1502, uh, the Nursing Home Ownership and Management Reform Act. Um, AB 1502 would require owners and operators to obtain prior approval from the California Department of Public Health. Uh, before acquiring or op operating a senior nursing facility. And um, AB 1502 is currently still going through the legislative process. It's on the Senate side uh, and the Committee of Health. Um, and yeah, that is the only update that I, I have today. Great. Uh, 
Great. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate your being here. Thank uh, you. Anyone else? Ronson, I do have some information on AB 1482, or do you want me to wait till we get to that on the agenda or bring it up now? Um, you can bring it up now. Okay. So AB 1482 is actually from 2019. It's called the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, tenancy rent caps. And um, this was an attempt to, to control the amount that people can raise rents that property owners can. The problem was that the legislation did not include mobile home parks. And I know Zoma's here in the meeting. And this came to my attention when the Skyline Mobile Home Park contacted us uh, several months ago saying new owners took over and they were raising the um, rents beyond what should have been acceptable, beyond what 1482 designates because mobile home parks were not in there. And this is a senior uh, park for 55 and older and um, I don't know what the current situation is, but I can tell you that Torrance, um, I had contacted them and they did put this on their um, uh, docket um, to look into this. Uh, Michelle Ramirez of the Torrance Community Development Director, she submitted this at the April 26th Torrance City Council meeting and asked that they accept and file a report on rent stabilization options, specifically for tenants of mobile home parks and provide direction regarding rent stabilization options for tenants of mobile home parks. And I'm going to uh, provide the link to that in the follow-up information. Um, I do have great concerns, not just for senior mobile home parks, but for this one in particular. Zoma, do you have anything to add to that? Thank you, Laurie. Uh, yes, so the uh, community development director does continue to bring that same, well, not that same item, but items related to that mobile park to mayor and council um, for direction. And um, I believe um, there is scheduled to be another meeting regarding that same item, or she will be putting uh, an item on the next council meeting, or at least by the end of this fiscal. So, um, in the same uh, manner, requesting guidance from mayor and council on how to proceed with that um, concern from those senior citizens in that mobile park. And so they I, continue it, to engage on that item. And it would be nice if there was legislation beyond what Torrance is doing. This is a state assembly bill, Eric. <laughs> is this something that you can initiate? Um, because I, I don't know how the bill got passed without anybody even knowing noticing that mobile home parks were not part of the equation. So maybe you could look into this for us to see if um, Assembly Member Murasuchi could initiate something. Definitely. I'll go ahead and speak with the Assembly Member. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? And any other legislators or shall we move on? I have a question. Uh, yes. For Here for Eric about uh, when when can we respond or support this AB 1502? You said it's in the health committee, in the Senate health committee? Right. Um, I would have to follow up with you on that. I'm not sure when um, we'll be able to show support. Um, but yes, it, it, it got through uh, the assembly. Uh, with enough votes. So it's just right now in the Senate. I'll have to follow up with you on that one. Okay, Do you, you know who is sponsoring that in the Senate? Um, give me one second. I'm sorry, I do not have that information with no, uh, on me right now. We can send that out later yes. if you come up with it. That would be great. Okay. Uh, thank you. All right. It looks like we could move on to item uh, number seven. And uh, Lori is going to uh, give us a little review of the, the new website senior services page. Oh, Lori, you're on mute. You know, I was busy writing notes. I <laughs> you were too quick for me. Okay, let me share a screen. And sorry, I have too many things open. Hang on a sec. 
Okay. We'll try this again. Share screen. Um, why am I not seeing it? There we go. Okay. So I'm not sure if all of you know, but last October, we launched a, a remake um, of the COG website. They did an amazing job. It's beautiful. Look, you can even see the palm trees moving right there on the, the cover there. And so we took another look at the um, programs for senior services. And um, on here. Okay, so I wanted to make sure that everybody here was um, aware. So here there's an, a nice menu. Okay, and if you go under programs and you go to senior services in the South Bay, my computer's not too fast today. Sorry about that. So hang on. Sorry. Okay, so um, here we have an outline of that we support awareness among cities of various programs that serve the community seniors and promote an age-friendly South Bay. Specifically, these include identifying mobility and housing strategies to seniors. And over here on the right side, we have different sections with an overview. For instance, on South Bay population demographics, here is a chart that is the 2020 census on the population of people in each of our cities and the um, number of people that are um, seniors in relation to that. Um, we have the AARP, friendly, age-friendly states and communities, information there. We have, so you can click on all of these. And then I really wanna point out, so the working group meeting that we're in right now, if you ever wanna go back and say, I remember there was a presentation on such and such, you know, all the meetings are here, the future meetings, okay, a past meeting. When you click on the meeting, you can watch a video and, um, of the meeting if you wanted to listen to a speaker again or a particular issue. And then we have all the supporting documents here. So last month we had um, uh, a presentation on the master plan of aging, from the state and other supporting documents. So I just wanted you to know that all that information is there for you. Oh, Lori, can I yeah. ask? Um, so how do you, I'm following you here under programs and I'm on the senior page. So where do you connect to the senior services working group? Oh, okay. You're not seeing the same thing I'm seeing on my screen. You're uh, not seeing the senior services working group right now? Um, what came up is, was uh, senior services in the South Bay and then uh, sustainable South Bay and active senior services. And okay. then I, okay, I'm sorry. Let me stop my share. Let me try again. Oh, no, I, no, uh, Lori, uh, uh, it was working. It's just, I think Britt's navigating it herself. And so she was just, oh, where, uh, oh, yeah. where, where did she right. to get to the, Oh, oh yeah, and then maybe just tower. There's two two ways to get to the. Yes, um, there is two yeah. ways to get well, to it. Yeah. In other words, is there from the programs page? Is there a way to access the senior working group, or do you yes. have to go? Meetings? Yes, there is. There's two ways you could you could go right to committees and agendas, but if you go right to programs and you go to senior services, that's exactly where I was at right now, Britt. And what what do you click on to get to the senior services working group? Then? You you scroll down under overview, and there's a group right there that says. SBCC OG Senior Services Working Group. Do you see that on my screen? Uh, let's see. Your photo is in front of it. So, oh, here, yes. Okay. 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 Well, my photo is important All part right. of the website. Yeah. <laughs> this, okay. All right. So then, then that's all down and here you go over the to the working group. Good. Okay. All right. See the past meetings, the agendas, you can yeah. click on it and listen to the um, videos. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. I don't see anything about videos. It says date agenda minutes. Where do you okay. find that? Yep. Right. Let me go to the last month's meeting. Which is March. I let's see. Okay. Oh, oh, do you click and on the here? Zoom um view zoom meeting minutes video. So you have to, so you have to click on the title to get that. 
Yes, you go to the particular date of the meeting. So that was March 22nd. Oh, okay. And there, right there it says, and then if you click on that link, it'll take you oh. to the YouTube version. Okay. Of okay. So in other words, on the first page, you only see, have an opportunity to click on agenda or minutes, but then right. if you click on the senior services ex itself, then you get the option. Absolutely. Okay. And then there's a lot of other um, really good, um, helpful um, information on here. And I want to tell you, if you don't see information here that you think should be on our website, let us know. So you can see right there, look at that, helping the elderly live productively. So we have a link right to your site, Britt. Okay. okay. Then we have an aging preparedness kit. And then we added recently a, quite a few links on senior scam stopper resources. Everything from contractors, financial protection, the insurance. Then if you come down to transportation, you can go to LA Metro, which will give you tips on navigating through the, the bus. Um, let's see here. Oops, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, that my, my computer's acting, but there you go. How much does it cost for seniors? And there's information on the fares and you can go through that website. Okay, and then um, housing. So you have Home Share South Bay, which you'll never get tired of me talking about. Um, affordable living for the aging and the path. So you were asking earlier about information for um, Courtney and Anna. There's the link to path, the village movement. And then we have specifically wellness, hospital programs for seniors, dementia, senior employment opportunities. So if you see, um, if you don't see something here that you think should be included, let me know. I just wanted to make sure that everybody here knew that th this, these tools are available to you. Yeah, that's great. I hope you all found that helpful. Now you know, there it is. <laughs> you have to search a little bit once you get there. It's lots of good information. It's, it's um, actually very intuitive and user-friendly. It's just hard to walk through while every here but yeah. I, I don't if you have a problem just let me know wonderful okay thank you any any questions uh to Lori about that all right let's move on then and I think uh Jackie is on uh our uh, executive director for the council is Jackie Backrack and she's going to give us a little up overview and update welcome yes. Jackie thank you uh, the COG is really active in a lot of different areas. Uh, one that we're working on, which is sort of tangential, is we're, uh, I don't know if any of you are signed up for what's called Alert South Bay, but if there's tra traffic accidents or obstructions in the South Bay, uh, you can get a notice so that you can stay clear of those areas. Uh, it's now being, um, it, it, the, the COG will soon be taking over the oversight of that organization. So. Uh, we're very busy on that transition, but the place that, and then also at our board meeting on Thursday night, which will be virtual, um, so you can all join in, we're having two speakers talk about the drought. One is from Metropolitan Water District, and he's going to give us just a short update, but then we have the new general manager of West Basin Municipal Water District, who will also come talk about the drought. At each one of our board meetings, we always have, uh, for the last probably six months, we've had somebody from the Department of Public Health who gives us a COVID update and other issues that are dealing, that are important in our uh, service planning area, SPA 8. And then the, the things I wanna really tell you most about, well, so before I get to that, we're also working on a SCAG study uh, to uh, look at how ADUs, uh, accessory dwelling units, which I know we've talked about in this meeting, how they're being used in the South Bay, what the rents are, are they reasonable, um, affordable housing um, uh, substitutes. We also have an ADU calculator that our cities are working on. And I'll let you know when that's available, but what the ADU calculator would do is when you, uh, if you are interested in converting your property to have an accessory dwelling unit, you would go to the ADU calculator and it would pick up any costs that your city might be charging, any constraints, any, any issues, so that you could actually figure out what the approximate cost would be to you to build an ADU. So it's a, a, gonna be a very useful tool and we're just working out the kinks on that. And uh, most of our cities will be participating in that. 
The, the, the other thing I wanna mention is we're extremely uh, active this year, more than I think we've ever been on the legislative front. Thanks to our incredible legislators, uh, primarily um, Senator Ben Allen, uh, Assemblyman uh, Al Marasucci and Assemblyman Michael, Mike Gibson. We have three pieces of legislation that, are, uh, that we are promoting in Sacramento. AB 2074, and this is, this is so stupid because I have a mental block about this. AB 2074 is a bill that, and maybe I've mentioned this before, but it's a bill that promotes micromobility. And micromobility are slow speed vehicles. Um, that would be scooters and segways, but it would also be um, uh, uh, neighborhood electric vehicles, which are vehicles that go like, like street worthy golf carts which uh, would be are great for local errands, very safe for seniors. And, uh, and we're also gonna be trying to look for, for trikes for, for people that wanna get around on a bike but don't have the balance issues that others have. Um, the the micromobility bill would ask CARB to create a rebate, CARB is California Resources Board, to create a rebate for people that wanna purchase a micromobility device. What we're finding, and I had no idea about this, but I'm really pretty excited about it, is that there are firms that actually are providing um, or, or creating vehicles in this category for physically disadvantaged people. For example, wheelchair accessible vehicles uh, that would, would be able to um, be qualifying for this micromobility rebate. There's uh, other scooters that are, there's a company called Fat Scooters, P-H-A-T, and it's fat because they're very wide and very safe and have a seat. And so they're, these are really for people with, with uh, balance issues or physically challenged. So the reason we're doing this, the micromobility bill, which is AB 2074, and we hope that you'll um, support it and send letters for it. And this is the one that's sponsored by Mike Gibson. And I think our other assembly members are and senators are co-authors. But um, the reason we're doing this is of course, i am probably mentioned to you the local travel network. We're trying to create a network of streets throughout the South Bay where you can safely use one of these vehicles to get from one city to another for local, local trips and get to destinations and get to shop at local shopping. And so you don't need a big car, you don't need to um, fuel up your engine, but you can really get around to where you need to go. And I don't remember, um, if we've had a local travel network presentation on at this meeting, but if we haven't, we, we definitely should. The second bill that we're uh, promoting, and it is sponsored by Assemblyman Marisucci, is 2432. And 2432, AB 2432, and we also would love you to, to support this bill. This is really sort of a pro forma bill. In order for us to have neighborhood electric vehicle designations on our local travel network, we have to create a neighborhood electric vehicle plan. And so this bill allows us to do that. The final bill that we're, that we're uh, supporting, and it just, we just got a bill number, is SB 1444. And that's a bill sponsored right now by um, Senator Ben Allen. And it would create a South Bay Regional Housing Trust trust. And the idea would be that we would have money that would, uh, we would have money to uh, provide subsidies for affordable housing on developments that are being planned in cities. And uh, along with this, we're also asking our legislators to put in a request for about $50 million in the budget to seed our trust fund. Uh, we don't have a lot of specifics on the trust fund. And once we once we get the legislation, we will be working on the board of directors and, and the legal documents, but we are working on creating that. What we've done so far is we've asked our cities, are you supportive of this trust fund idea? And at this point, would you consider being a member? Uh, we've had, most of our cities are taking action at their council level. They're supportive of the legislation. And most of our cities say that they would consider being a charter member. Um, so we're moving forward on all of those fronts and the way, the way the affordable housing would work is if a developer, for example, wanted to put in a certain number of units, but they said that they couldn't really do affordable, we'd be able to give them a subsidy to help them with the affordable units. Um, I think that's it. Ronson, Lori, have I, Britt, have I missed anything? Well, I would just, um, 
mentioned that, uh, as you probably know, the Public Utility Commission is uh, uh, going to bring back that item on solar, uh, the whole solar uh, uh, funding and the um, the pricing on that. And um, when they previously, then they tabled it, as you recall, now it's being brought back. And we, uh, when it originally came out, were encouraging cities to do a letter um, asking them, you know, to reconsider this and uh, might be worth getting that going again, also from the COG and from the cities, because it's going to have a devastating effect on uh, influencing people to, in fact, spend the money to get solar. Well, we're, we're monitoring that right now. There's nothing to react to, um, as far as I know, but we well, are monitoring the issue. They're having public comment until June 10, I think it is, and then they're going to, um, uh, is it June 27th? It seems like it's coming up really quickly, so might be worth looking into to have something for the meeting Thursday night, the board meeting. Um, okay, I will, will, we will do that. Wonderful. So I don't know if anybody has any questions. Any other questions to Jackie? So great opportunity to, to tune in and hear uh, from some regional um, uh, officials about the drought Thursday night. So um, how do they access that link, Jackie, if they're in On the website, on the website. Oh, great, That's that awesome. wonderful That's website. Oh, you just go there and there you can download, you know, access the link. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Jackie. And um, we now have an opportunity for round robin from our uh, participants today. Anything happening in your organization that you'd like to share? And uh, Ronson, do you maybe want to coordinate that? Can you see hands up for that? Um, let's see, so Kathy, we'll, we'll go with Kathy first and then we'll, we'll go back to you, Lori. Um, Kathy, go ahead. Oh, Kathy, you're on mute. Hi, I'm from the um, Manhattan, Be Manhattan Beach Joslin Center Older Adult Program. And uh, we just had a health fair on Friday, the first time, of course, since uh, COVID. And uh, people just came out in bunches. <laughs> uh, we had about, oh, well, over 200 people. So as a comeback uh, event, it was, it was great. Um, yeah, we, and, uh, we staffed it at the COG. And yeah, it was, it, was, it was a great event. I almost lost my voice. There were so many people coming out. Asking questions That's good. about our senior service, Home Share South Bay and our water conservation efforts. So yeah, it was a great, great turnout. Yeah, yeah thanks thank for hosting that. Everyone I've talked to said it was great. I know staff from our help office uh, attended and um, uh, just, you know, great networking and have opportunity to talk to seniors. So um, yeah. it was pretty amazing. Go ahead. Oh, I think Kathy froze. Oh, Kathy froze. That's not good. Okay, Melissa, did you have a comment? Um, let's see, Melissa. Oh no, she left. She had to go to another meeting. Lori, do you want okay. to go? Lori has her hand up. I have a couple of updates. One, a couple of weeks ago, um, I represented the Cog at the Gardena's Seniors in the Fun Fun in the Sun event, which was very well attended and. Um, it was a hoot working with them and uh, two booths over was Brit's group help. So I got a chance to kind of um, network with them too. So um, people were very interested in the home share program that we were uh, talking about. And I've already had a couple of inquiries from presenting there. Secondly, I just wanted to mention that the board of supervisors approved a motion um, to proclaim May as older Americans month. Um, which is supposed to ensure appropriate resources for our vulnerable seniors. And it was unanimously approved and it's supposed to elevate the 58th annual Older Americans Recognition Day and support any of the county's efforts to, for older adults and to identify any gaps in providing comprehensive 
and proactive benefit navigators to assist older adults with enrollment in all programs and benefits um, available to enhance the quality of life. And lastly, Jackie doesn't even know this, but I have two matches on the Home Share South Bay program. And one wow. of them, um, they're just working on the lease through Silver Nest platform now. And um, I want to thank the PVE Police Department newsletter is where this older adult found it. Okay, and she is actually in Rolling Hills Estates. And she's an older woman who found a younger gentleman who's supposed to be moving in on June 1st. So I'm working with that. And the second one is moi. I am home sharing. And um, I officially started paying rent in May. And it's the opposite uh, for me. I'm moving into um, with an older gentleman. He's 83. And um, he, he represents all the reasons we promote this program. He was mm -hmm. lonely and looking for companionship a little bit during COVID. And his wife passed away a few years ago from Parkinson's. Two, now um, he had surgery on his back, but now he's able to walk. So now he wants to have a little extra money to do some traveling. So we have that in three. He gave up his car because he doesn't feel like he should be driving anymore. And so I'll be able to help him by driving him to pick up groceries and um, medicines. And just, you know, he, he's very self-sufficient. He Ubers all over the place. So I am journaling my experience so I can share it with you. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to share that. And as usual, we'll ask everybody to continue to promote the home sharing program and, and Sadly, with the information we gave on evictions, um, this might be um, an avenue that um, people um, will be interested in, in pursuing. The reception, like I said, at the Gardena event, they asked a lot of questions. So maybe that we're hopefully kind of coming out of COVID. I can present to more people in person. And um, I'm just was excited to share that with you. Thanks. Well, that's wonderful to have a firsthand experience like that. We'll have to uh, set you up with a blog and we can all follow Lori. <laughs> uh, yes, B. Uh, Lori, how many properties do you have right now that are available for people to rent? Well, sadly, not enough. Um, we're st that's been our biggest push is to get more homeowners to sign up for the program. Sure. Now, some people have signed up straight through Silver Nest, but not through us. So in the South Bay, I'm going to say there's maybe only about 20 properties and they range in rents because some people are doing it mainly for financial reasons. Sure. Uh, I can tell you um, that the one in Palace, um, uh, Rolling Hills Estates, her rent is, I think, 1500 which if you think about it, you know, a one bedroom apartment you wouldn't touch anything on the hill right. for 1500 You wouldn't touch any place in the whole South Bay for 1500 Okay, okay. So, so thank you for the question. Whatever you can do to keep pushing to get homeowners to sign up, that's our, our biggest uh, challenge. Thank you very much. Great. Any other questions? Anyone else have any updates or announcements they'd like to? Yes, Eric. Yes, hi, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, to answer your question earlier. Um, so AB 1502 uh, is being sponsored by the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. Um, it has not reached the Senate floor for a vote. So there isn't a floor manager that would uh, present the bill yet. And I believe Harriet Chase also had a question regarding 1502. Um, the Senate Health Committee has not set a hearing um, date for the bill, uh, but there is. But, but when that is scheduled, um, supporters of the bill would be able to call in and give a testimony in support of uh, AB 1502. And once that uh, hearing date is set, I'll make sure to um, uh, send an email to Ronson so that he can share it with everyone. Oh, great. Well, thanks so much for that information because the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, better known as CANR, uh, is highly respected uh, in California. And so, uh, you know, very trustworthy. And uh, so that's good to know that they're involved in this and promoting that. Yes. Thank you. Of course. Anyone else would love to hear how you're doing in your senior center? 
Um, and, uh, you know, whether all of your programs are open now or are you still doing some, some remote things? Um, anyone have anything they can? Yes, Diane. So um, we opened two weeks ago and uh, headcount is down. There's more, there are more men coming into the play pool in the billiard room because they don't have to have an appointment now. They can just come in. Um, we have some people that come in, we, but we're waiting for this to build to higher numbers. We're not serving the hot meals. And I think that's what's the, is not encouraging people to come back because they like to come in and talk and then eat and go home and go to bed. So uh, <laughs> we probably won't have hot meals until July because Torrance handles us. They handle us, um, Lennox, Carson, I think Manhattan Beach or Redondo, one or the other, and they might, and Torrance, of course, and they may be picking up another one, and they have to hire uh, site managers and drivers to deliver the meals, and so that's an issue that people just aren't trying to take those jobs. I, I don't know what the reason would be, and um, but we have Tai Chi on Fridays from 10 to 11 in our sports center. We can't use our main room in the back because Torrance YMCA uses that for the lunch every Wednesday. So we, we, don't, we don't go back into that room. Um, we're getting ready to start bingo. We just got our bingo after two and a half years that everything was kind of taken apart and moved. So the bingo machine is all back together. And so we're believing we'll start bingo next week, once a week. And it'll be in the morning time, maybe from 10.30 to 11.30, something like that. Then uh, we had a trip last week. We went to the Getty. And this week, Thursday, we're going to the LA County Fair, which would be our normal June. We have a trip once a month. Wow, that's so great. We yeah, we won't, do, we won't do anything in June because we're taking that because the county fair uh, closes down on the 31st. So we're doing that this week, Thursday. And uh, moving forward, there'll be trips planned. And that's what we're doing. Well, so do you have uh, a couple of vans or how do you do these uh, road trips? Well, our city pays for the bus. Oh, it's that bus. A regular 55 seat bus. Oh, and you you get you get a pretty good turnout for that? Uh, the turnout for the Getty, which was our very first trip, and there weren't many rules and regulations except that that the people had to wear a mask on the bus. And at the Getty, they had to wear a mask on the tram going up and down. And other than that, they didn't have to wear a mask. One of the restaurants, the main restaurant that everybody eats at, at the Giddy is only open to the staff. And so um, that's just a few changes I said, saw at the Giddy this year. And um, I think that we had about 30 some people on that bus. Usually our bus trips are full, 50 uh -huh. to 55 seats. So for the fair, um, this, look like we're, we're looking for at least 22 people to go on that and because it was so last minute because they decided when we went to the giddy on the bus they decided they'd like to go to the la county fair and so this is really a, in a week's time we're planning this trip and so usually Wonderful. buses are full and ever yeah. since i've been here the city has paid for our buses i know that doesn't happen all the time for every mm -hmm. senior center yeah that's wonderful thank you keeps the price well, down and it's great to uh, see you back up and, and operating to that level. And uh, good. Anyone else want to give us an update? Okay, hearing none. How about B? How are things going over there at the focal point? Sorry. There um. They're going well. We are only open in the mornings. Uh, we do not take walk-ins, but they could call us for appointments. Um, we, the last month or so, we've had um, many cases of elder abuse. Um, really? Yes. And it's been challenging. And the other thing is the tenants that, you know, they cannot find housing. Um, and we suggest, you know, maybe moving more inland or, you know, contacting a church, someone can share a room. We've uh, talked about Silver Nest, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them want to be here with their loved ones. 
And all we can do is listen and support them and give them resources. Um, my, my staff is absolutely great. And uh, we still have uh, guest speakers uh, once a month and uh, they can give us an overview of their services. We can read it you know, in our directory, but that's not the same. And lastly, our directory is being printed for the year uh, next week. And we've had a lot of changes with the COVID and um, we're looking forward to seeing the new edition and to be able to share it. Thank you. Wonderful. B is the director of Focal Point, which is a Torrance City program connected with their um, a Bartlett Center and this in senior services. And it's run all by volunteers and um, they particularly help seniors with housing. So good, hope, hope we can promote that Silver Nest uh, we are. Yeah. We are. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, Ronson and Delori, any last comments? Um, I, I forgot to mention, um, and you know about this, Britt, that on Thursday, the uh, Assistance League of the South Bay and San Pedro, um, there, I forgot what it's a committee, is having a presentation from somebody from HELP who will be talking mostly on caregivers. Um, situation updates on that. And I think she's going to cover some other programs that help is familiar with. So it's uh, free. You just need to RSVP because they're providing food. Um, but uh, just wanted well, to mention that. Uh, thanks. Thanks for um, bringing that up. Uh, yes, that's Artis Shubin, who is our community services specialist and very knowledgeable on just uh, caregiving and county programs and everything. So uh, be very informative. It's going to be over there at the Assistance League in uh, the San, uh, on San, in San Pedro. I'll be there. By, by their post office over there. Okay, uh, anything else? Um, just wanna say, you know, we have uh, a really good presentation lined up already for the next meeting. Uh, Scan Help is gonna come by to talk about uh, free services they're providing seniors. And so that will be really interesting. And then also just wanted to reiterate, like, you know, we, we love to hear about different programs and initiatives from all of you. So if you'd like to present, uh, feel free to reach out to Lori and I, and we can maybe carve out some time on, on the agenda for you. Um, we had, uh, I, I believe the Peninsula, Peninsula uh, Library uh, District present one time, and that was great. So I'd love, love to do more uh, uh, local presentations as well. And then, uh, yeah, it sounds like we're going to be looking into uh, this Donna Benton from USC uh, to present on senior services. That's the person that Laura recommended, Laura Trio, Trio, and then um, and then I guess we'll check to see if we did a local travel network presentation. If not, I mean that's definitely something we should we should like we should do on our future meetings. So yeah, I I think we did one when we early on when we started the working group, but it'd certainly be timely to have that again. And, um, and I'll just mention I have a conflict Thursday night, so I won't be able to be at the board meeting. So I'm hoping Lori and Ronson can do a good overview on Dr. Treho's presentation, which uh, I thought was really uh, good information we wanna pass on to our uh, council people. Good, okay. Well, uh, any last words, Jackie? Um, no, no, thank you. I think another great meeting. Thank you all right. for coming. Okay, well, good to see you all. And we'll see you again in, uh, what is it? Two months, July 26th. And so uh, staff will be sending you out the updates on who the speakers for that are confirmed and agenda and so forth. So look for that. Okay, have, uh, have a safe uh, couple of months. Good Thank to see you. you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. All righty, bye-bye. Bye, everyone.